right, tonight we're going to have, I'd like to welcome all of you to the College of Complexes tonight. It's going to be an open microphone. The topic is, has Trump made America greater again, or should he be impeached to save the nation from destruction? We'll uh, start off with a 10 to 12 minute, uh, uh, everybody gets 10 to 12 minutes. We will be trying to do our best to maintain taping. The tuition first, free. It's tuition free tonight, so you guys not only get a chance to put your, uh, to, to talk to, about, to, to say your piece about Trump, but you'll also get to do it for no cost, which is the way most liberals like it. We still would like to have you at least give Heather a decent tip tonight, so remember that uh, she is also foregoing her dollar per person per... No, no. Okay, okay. We're going to have announcements. We'll get right into the uh, complaint session tonight about Trump, and then we'll wrap, I'll wrap things up. So you've got some announcements. Let's get me ask tonight is that if you're going to get about 10 to 12 minutes, Please be cogent, and please just don't make it a, you know, if you have a solution in mind or a suggestion or some means of improvement that Trump can do, I'd like to hear it. Okay. You know, so with that, I'll uh, make the last rebuttal tonight, just so, unless you want me to do the first one, but who would like to go first? I'm asking for a volunteer to go first. If not, I'm going to pick somebody up from the crowd. Dennis looks like he's ready. I'll go. All right, Charlie. Oh, good boy. Let's Charlie. get Charlie. You guys got one. gold feet. Oh, oh, yeah. I could do this. I could do this walking in my sleep. Well then, go and ahead, Charlie. All right, I'm going to be eclectic as usual here. And no, no, no. All right, we'll get you kicking here. I'm going to talk about some things about Trump and non-Trump. But I decided to talk about it, raise on a few things that perhaps um, you don't read about in the news, uh, relying upon my personal experience as a federal employee and representative of the deep state right now. Um, anyhow, uh, one of the things that we've got some issues with with Trump is I have never seen federal employees have to avoid the they have to follow something called the Code of Ethics. And we're given classes on this um, at least once a year. And every federal employee has to sign a document that they fully comprehend and understand them. They're vaguely called the Code of Ethics. And they're posted in workplaces and around. And they're enforced by something called the, Inspector, the Office of the Inspector General. Uh, or the general counsel's office. And one of these are that you you have to avoid the image of impropriety. And one of these things are you have to divorce yourself from outside financial activities. That somehow you are profiting personally by virtue of your position. Now in the extreme case, this means like in the simplest things, you cannot accept gifts of any kind. Um, in many locations, I've seen this, they would send employees, a company or something that does business with the government, would send a box of candy at Christmas to employees. They were rounded up and sent back. Uh, people who had certain positions had to resign from the positions. We had a member, an employee, who was elected to a local city council in his town, and he was precluded from taking office because it'd be a conflict of interest, they said. But the code of ethics, now here you've got a guy who's interconnected there. He's, he's actually staying at government expense in buildings that, and facilities that he owns and profits by his direct activities. This is so far over the line, it's unbelievable. 
And the code of ethics very strict. These guys have the United States Forces have no sense of humor. They actually on one of the talk shows, they have a guy, the White House actually has and other normal administrations, they have an attorney who serves full time and keeps his eye out that there's no violations of this in other administrations. And he's now a talk, he shows up on the talk shows, uh, and he just can't fathom, but they're doing these things. <coughs> this is complete opposite um, of the standards um, that there are for um, these situations. Nevertheless, I, it, it's like wide open. There's no application of law, rule, or regulation is the expression we give. And I can't fathom that. Uh, code of ethics violations are, it, 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 there's things, there's other ones I could go on this topic alone by itself. Hiring, hiring your daughter. It, it, nepotism is not allowed. It, the, the situations like this. The, the, you have to have competition for positions, even a, you know, even with appointments, you you, you just don't reward uh, people in that fashion. Uh, so anyhow, this. All right, the other one I'd like to talk about that I have some direct experience on is the standard form 86. A standard form 86 is required if you have a position and you need a security clearance. Um, certainly anybody in law enforcement in the government, um, and depending on the nature of your position, you have to get a security clearance, meaning you have to fill out a, a detailed um, questionnaire regarding your entire, every aspect of your activities and your past, and they assign uh, investigators who look and, and verify and make a determination if you qualify as a person to occupy a position with these responsibilities. And it's very, they do not, this is not just pretend investigation. They, uh, there is a significant expense involved in their investigations, which I can tell you, um, there, some people wanted to get security clearances for advancement purposes, and the employer, the government, would not, would said, well, we're just not gonna do this. It costs several thousand dollars, and we're simply not gonna do uh, an investigation for no, no real apparent purpose. Uh, there were complaints in that regard. Now, other people, if, if it, and also these are living documents. If at any given time it is discovered that you have, and this is a real crime, and among the feds, this is, this is like one of the worst things you could do, is to falsify a government form. They do not have, they do not look positively upon anyone who falsifies the form. And they certainly don't look positively upon anyone who falsifies the standard form 86. According to the latest rules that I've read, and I've had to argue these things myself personally for application nationwide, if they discover something wrong with your standard form 86, they remove you from your position immediately and you have maybe, you have 30 days to appeal it, and you that was including the hearing to the if you want the civil service commission, which is like a court. So they move very quickly on this. You are relieved of your position. They come and escort you from the facility by two guards, normally, and you're out the door, and that's the end of it. And then, if they discovered at any time you falsify information, the same thing can happen. And it has happened to people when they discover things. Okay, the other one that you might not be aware of is that there are very stringent rules against federal employees using social media. 
I don't know why he didn't come up with this sooner. We have the President of the United States tweeting or communicating using social media. Federal employees are not allowed to do that. I negotiated the use of social media. You are very much restricted. You certainly don't use your title. As a matter of fact, the rules are written. If they know that you're a federal employee, even if you don't use your title or identifier, you are still guilty. Let's say the Secretary of Transportation, this child woman, started on, went out on social media, and if, okay, just so she didn't use her name, let's say she was tweeting or emailing all kinds of stuff about uh, transportation, she still would be held responsible for those comments. Oh, you, you, you just can't hide your news. In essence, you're precluded from using it. Now the president comes along, these are, believe you me, I emails and Facebook, and I lecture new employees on this, I say don't use it. Use it as very sparingly and strictly, always as if very formal letters, with, as if it's like letterheads. And this guy is doing exactly the opposite. You cannot communicate, you cannot use you can't, you can't use a government computer like this. You're not allowed to do that. Some of the military, I ran into a military guy who went in to see his boss because he sent one little email using the government account. He went in and was hoping he could get out of it. He came to see me because he was very disciplined. I go, I can think we can in one email, he ordered something and instead he responded to the company and he used his government account and I said, I, 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 think, I think I can get you out of this. But he was really sweating it. There you guy doing it every day of the week. I'm going, you can't do this. You're not allowed to do that. You can't, and even in the private sector, you can't go into social media and say whatever you want. <laughs> well, wow. Let's see, what else we got here? Regulations. Okay, now wait a minute. He said, oh, we're going to get rid of regulations. They're costing us jobs, right? We got to have get rid of these regulations. And businessmen got to, can't deal with the regulations. Well, and then he said he was going to get rid of, he actually wrote this thing, we're going to get rid of, the, for every three regulations, or he, for every three regulations, you had to get rid of one. You could keep two. Well, that presupposes that regulations are like all equal. They're not widgets. <laughs> They're all different. They're of may, may, not not one of not two of them are identical. And the other thing is, where do regulations come from? Now somehow people don't say, well, where do they come from? What do you think, some bureaucrat just sits around? What do you think we used to just sit around and say, hey, what do you want to do today? Let's write some regulations. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's not how it works. The government, something called the Congress of the United States, passes a law. And very often that law has very not, not much definition to it. And then the agencies of the government, the appropriate agencies, redefine that or refine it actually to what it actually the rule is and that's what a regulation comes from and then they're sent out to the public for comment period and things like that till they're finalized but they're all based in law they're not made up these are laws passed by the United States and the other thing about regulations why do you think a regulation is written there's only one reason, because somebody did something wrong, and you don't want to let it happen again. That's why regulations are written. Somebody did something wrong, and the responsibility of the government is to see that there is not a recurrence of that situation. By changing the regulations, or writing regulations, that it, someone is not harmed again. 
that's what you expect responsible government to do. Now, to come along and say, we're going to get rid of regulations means what? To mean there were no situation that precipitated this regulation? Or did it go away? And they have lifespan. They don't last forever. They, they go out of date. And you have time frames on them. They don't last to the end of time. So there's a terminal date on that. But getting looking at regulations other than on a case by case cases is not good government. And the last thing I'll talk about, the one that I really like to know, this one I'll talk about, is I'm very much concerned because I'm involved in railroading and public transit issues, is infrastructure. And I personally have no idea whatsoever what the government of the United States is doing regarding the funding of infrastructure. It's just, there's no way to figure it out. I've been following it since the campaign. Um, what exactly, Trump, Trump says he's going to give $100 trillion for infrastructure, and he turned around and he actually cut the funding for public transit for capital projects, major things. They have a thing called Tiger Grants. It's an acronym for uh, community investment. But this is what you start with. Now, he comes in, oh, he says, I'm going to give a trillion dollars. And then we've been waiting and waiting. And the, actually, the only thing he has done is the cut the funding for infrastructure. And then they're saying, well, we're going to come around, we're going to have an infrastructure plan. Well, by the way, he also said, oh, I changed my mind. One trillion's not too much. At most, maybe 200 billion. Republicans don't want to spend some money. So suddenly we lost. Charlie, there's no filibuster here. He knows. What is he, that supposed to be? It's been 15 minutes, Charlie. Oh, no filibuster. Yeah. Well, it's been 15 minutes. We've allowed all you. All right. Is that it? All right, I'll go. He was giving you time. Now, all right. Now, uh, let's... All right, uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Charlie. Somebody better get up there next, because otherwise Charlie could have kept speaking for a while. Uh, I know what I'm talking about. All right. Oh, ten minutes, Don. Ten minutes. Oh, I mean, I know you have that long because I want to eat. You know, yeah, you know, I'm just, only doing this to, so I'm only doing this on someone other than Charlie. You know, um, so what's the topic tonight? Trump? Yes. Okay. We'll, open mic. Open, open mic. microphone. Well, or talk should oh, Trump wait, be in the All right. Well, I, I, all right. Well, I just want to say for, for just for the it's record coming. that Trump is a fascist. And, um, then now a lot of people, you know, a lot of people would say fascist. Why do you call him a fascist? I uh, and the reason, and I've heard I've heard conservatives call Hillary Clinton a fascist. You know, that the calling her a communist wasn't wasn't bad enough. So, uh, but what what is a, a fascist? You know, if you look. I, I read a really interesting book called The Anatomy of Fascists. They look at, they, they look at the, the Nazis, they look at the original fascists. I mean, the original fascist was the Mussolini and the Italian fascists. And then you had some imitators of them, the Nazis, for example. The, um, there was uh, Franco and the, the, uh, the, the fascists in Spain, the, the, uh, the Falange, as they were called. And, yeah, and there have been other movements here, and they're not all of them ended up taking over countries. They were often, but for example, there's the Golden Dawn in Greece today. Uh, what all of these movements have in common is that they're, uh, first of all, they're highly nationalistic, and they are also, and their nationalism has, <clears throat> has, has a component of racial and religious intolerance in it. In other words, you know, this is our, our nation is a nation of a certain ethnic and or religious group. Uh, and, and if you're not part of, if you're not, and if you're not part of that group, then you're not really, you're not really our nationality. So then, um, another component of fascism is that, at least as Mussolini saw it, that it was, 
you know, well, it was an attempt to reconcile capitalism and socialism. So we're going to have capitalism, but it'll be under government control. That's, that's the idea. And then another component is that, fasc is that fascists, once they take power, the country turns into a totalitarian dictatorship because fascists do not t tolerate any dissent uh, or any kind of opposition. And, and so, now, and now the reason I believe that Trump is a fascist is number one, oh, I forgot to mention one other thing that, about the fascists. When they're out of power, they believe in using violence uh, to achieve their political goals. Well, of course they believe in violence to achieve their political goals when they're in power, but that doesn't make them different from other governments. But most activists, most activists, um, you know, want to do the whole Gandhi, Martin Luther King thing, and you know, be nonviolent. Fa not the fascists. The fascists believe in running people over with cars and stuff like that if they, you know, if, if they, you know, if they don't like them. And and so so the so the um, the fascists are. That, so that's another major component of fascism. And now, this is why I consider Trump a fascist. He fits all of these criteria, especially in his presidential campaign last year, because he, you know, he did this highly nationalistic thing, make America great again, yeah. America first, blah, blah, blah. Good. And there was a highly racial component in it, you know, and Trump is a racist, okay? A lot of people, a lot of Trump's supporters might not want to admit this, but when you start saying, when when you take an entire group of people and say they're all they're all bad or they're all this because of their ethnicity, well that's racism, and he does that with Mexicans quite a lot. He's also, I mean, he goes after Mexicans the most. He's, but he's also he's also gone after blacks. He's gone and he goes after Muslims and uh, and and all kinds you know other groups too. He goes after gays. Uh, so. That's another way that, um, and then the other thing is that about Trump is that he's not unlike, let's say, a guy like Pat Buchanan, who who says some of the same things as Trump. Trump goes a step further. He actually advocates violence. At his rallies, you know, there was some protester would show up, and, and the Trump supporters would get angry, and Trump would say, "Somebody go knock the shit out of that guy." He'd say yeah. to the microphone. That's good. And so, so this is that's another way in which Trump is is really not a conservative. He's really a fascist. And now, the other now since he's become president, he's actually governed more like a conservative, wanting to you know wanting to privatize everything, deregulate everything, and so on, and the usual conservative agenda in this country. But as a, as a candidate, though, he campaigned more like a fascist, talking about uh, talking about economic self-sufficiency. Let's uh, let's 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 stop all this free trade stuff and let's uh, protect American industry and so on. Um, and 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 that's that's more in line with with fascist ideas about economics. Um, but one thing that every fascist leader has to have. Oh, by the way. Uh, an effective, not every fascist movement has a leader, but an effective fascist movement, a movement that takes power, always has a leader. And they always call him the leader. You know, Hitler, uh, Mussolini was Il Duce, Hitler was Der Führer. Uh, uh, you know, Franco was El Caudillo. Juan Perón was, was El Leader in our, in, in, within his uh, political party in Argentina. And then there was uh, actually Actually, Quebec had a fascist, a lot of people don't know this, but Quebec had a fascist premier from the 1930s to the 1950s, a fellow named Maurice Duplessis, who was, his members of his party called him Le Chef, which in French means the boss. And, and, what do we call Donald Trump? Well, well, that's, you know, he doesn't use that, that leader term so much, except that his followers, people like Richard Spencer, do call him our leader. And uh, the, the, the really fascist followers of Trump, and they're, and they're around. And, and those guys, they serve the same function. Those guys that went to Charlottesville, for example, 
they serve the same function for Trump that the black shirts served for Mussolini or that the brown shirts served for Hitler. They're essentially Trump's paramilitary, Trump's enforcers. Now, how many of y'all have heard of a guy named Roger Stone? Every, hands yeah. up, everybody. Okay, I, I like him. Oh yeah, Roger Stone. Okay, He's I don't cool. know who like. Okay, so somebody not only heard of Roger Stone but but likes him. That's that's yeah. extraordinary. Is that you, Charlie? Yeah. Okay, you're playing devil's advocate. Can I get the money, Okay, okay. Now, Roger Stone was a guy that used to work, used to he used to be a dirty trickster for for uh, Richard Nixon back in the day. These days, he's working for Trump. In the when the Republicans held their convention in, in Cleveland in 2016, there was a lot of Republicans, especially delegates, who did not want to vote for Trump. What, three minutes left? They're, they didn't want to vote for Trump. So Roger Stone came along and said <coughs> and threatened violence against, against any delegate that didn't vote for Trump. Um, what he specifically threatened to do was give out the hotel room numbers of the anti-Trump delegates. And now, uh, I just heard that Roger Stone is threatening violence against any Republicans who support impeachment. So, um, all right. So, anyway, I'll let I'll let, let you all think about that, and uh, let's move on to the, another speaker. All right. Yes. Oh no. Ten minutes. Order. Fifteen. Ten minutes. Ready when you're set. It's on. Roger Waters. Yep. Pink, pink Position in power. The worst. Of course, Donald Trump should be impeached, but where do we go from there? I'm going to discuss this topic and then expand upon it. To say that Donald Trump should be impeached is a no-brainer. To suggest that Donald Trump has made America great again is bogus. But let us suppose that Donald Trump is impeached. We must still deal with President, now VP, Mike Pence, Trump's cabinet, and the Republican majority in Congress, besides the wild, wacky, extreme, and dangerous Rep Republican Party's agenda. Robert B. Reich was Secretary of Labor under uh, President Bill Clinton. And this is from Reich. We already have four good reasons to impeach Trump, and a fifth may be on the way. This is from April 6th of this year. By my count, there are now four grounds to impeach Donald Trump. The fifth appears to be on its way. First, in order, in taking the oath of office, the president promises to, quote, faithfully execute the laws in the Constitution. That's Article 2, Section 2. But Trump is unfaithfully executing his duties as president by, by accusing his predecessor, President Obama, of, of undertaking an illegal and impeachable act which absolute, with absolutely no evidence to support the accusation. This act was that Barack Obama supposedly ordered an illegal wiretap of Donald Trump's phones. Second, Article 1, Section 9 of the Constitution forbids government officials from taking things of value from foreign governments. But Trump is making big money off of his Trump International Hotel by steering foreign diplomatic uh, delegates, delegations to it and will make a bundle off China's recent decision to grant his trademark applications for the Trump brand, decisions Chinese authorities arrived at directly because of decisions Trump made as president. Third, the First Amendment of the Constitution bars any law, quote, respecting and establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, unquote. But Trump's ban on travel into the United States from six Muslim countries, which he initiated, advocated for, and overseas, violates that provision. Number four, the First Amendment also bars, quote, abridging the freedom of the press, unquote. But Trump's labeling the press, quote, the enemy of the people, unquote, and choosing who he invites to news conferences based on whether they've given him favorable coverage violates this provision. A fifth possible ground, if the evidence is there, Article 2, Section 3 of the Constitution defines, quote, treason against the United States, unquote, as adhering to their enemies, giving them aid and comfort, unquote. Evidence is mounting that Trump and his 
aides colluded with Russian operatives to win the 2016 presidential election. Presidents can be impeached for what the Constitution calls, quote, high crimes and misdemeanors, unquote. The question is no longer whether there are grounds to impeach Trump. The practical question is whether there's the political will. Mm -hmm. As long as Republicans remain in the majority in the House, where a bill of impeachment originates, it's unlikely. Another reason why it's critically important to flip the House in 2018. This is a uh, action from uh, Credo that I did um, May 23rd of this year. House Republicans, are you with your party or the country? The petition to House Republicans reads, your constituents deserve an impartial investigation into Donald Trump's ties to Russia. Your party's leaders are refusing to authorize one, but you should not help enable their political game plan. Sign on to the discharge petition demanding a vote on the Protecting Our Democracy Act. Congressional Republicans must create a, an independent commission to investigate the full extent of Trump's ties to Russia as well as his obstruction of justice, abuses of executive authority, and breaches of national security. Another action alert from Credo that was done more recently, uh, not long ago, um, August 21st, tell Congress Trump investigation must be truly independent. Petition to Congress. Ensure the independence of criminal investigations and protect the rule of law. Protect Special Prosecutor Walter Mueller from Trump's abuse of power and restore the independent counsel statute as enacted in the Ethics and Government Act of 1978. And here we have another one from Credo Action. Tell Congress, join lawsuit against Trump's bribes. This was done June 17th of this year. Petition to key U.S. representatives and senators. Join Blumenthal and Conyers versus Trump and ask the courts to hold Donald Trump accountable to the Constitution and require him to come to Congress and obtain its consent if he wants to accept benefits from foreign states. Compliance with the Constitution and opposition to corruption in government should not be partisan issues. And we have uh, one more from Credo, and that was done um, April 4th of this year. Stand with Representative Bomenauer, no taxpayer money for Trump's hotels. Petition to the United States Congress. Pass the no taxpayer revenue used to monetize the presidency, no Trump act which would block taxpayer dollars from flowing to hotels owned by the president or his relatives. Well, that's as far as the uh, impeachable things. Now, there are a lot of non-impeachable reasons uh, why the Trump-Pence administration has to go. And it simply would not be my presentation this evening without mentioning climate disruption in some way. And I've read my copy of an inconvenient sequel, Truth to Power, by Al Gore, the companion book to the recent movie of the same name. As chair of the Climate Reality Project, Al Gore has written an excellent action handbook to inspire, motivate, and empower us to tackle our climate crisis. This is from an inconvenient sequel, Truth to Power, page 227. We know that President Donald Trump once called climate change a Chinese hoax, although he later claimed he was joking. And the man he appointed to head the Environmental Protection Agency, Scott Pruitt, even denied the most basic scientific finding concerning global warming, that carbon dioxide emissions trap heat in the atmosphere. That fact was proven by scientists more than 150 years ago. This is from uh, April 4th of this year from the Sierra Club. Trump, Trump's energy department just banned the phrase climate change in staff memos and briefings. The Energy Department's International Climate Office just told staff to stop using the phrases climate change, emissions reduction, and Paris Agreement. It's absolutely insane, and I couldn't agree more. The word ban was leveled on the same day President Trump signed an executive order unraveling most of President Obama's clean energy policies, which I, which I did favor, and still do, and rolling back the United States commitment under the Paris International Climate Agreement of December 2015, which I did support the United States being a part of. We need jobs. Here's something April 20th of this year, ironically two days before Earth Day, an AP exclusive, President Pesticide Maker Tries to Kill Risk Study. 
Dow Chemical is pushing the Trump administration open to scrapping regulations to ignore the findings of federal scientists who point to a family of widely used toxic, toxic chemical pesticides called organophosphates as harmful to about 1,800 critically threatened or endangered species. Dow Chemical wrote a, two million, wrote a $1 million check. That's a $1 million check to help underwrite Trump's inaugural festivities. And its chair and CEO, Andrew Liveris, heads a White House manufacturing working group. The industry's request comes after US EPA Administrator Scott Pruitt announced last month he was reversing a Trump era effort to bar the use of Dow's chlorpyrifos pesticide on food after recent peer-reviewed studies found that even tiny levels of exposure could hinder the development of children's brains. In his prior job as Oklahoma's Attorney General, Pruitt often aligned himself in legal disputes with the interests of executives and corporations who supported his state campaigns. He filed more than a dozen lawsuits seeking to overturn some of the same regulations he is now charged with forcing. Continuing on, what do you think about when the wall, when you heard the expression, the wall is heard and seen? We have the Great Wall of China, built along an east to west line across the historical northern borders of China to protect the Chinese states and empires against nomadic raids and invasions. There is the Western Wall, including the Wailing Wall, in the old city of Jerusalem, which is the holiest place where Jews are allowed to pray. Berlin Wall, a symbol of the Cold War, was a guarded concrete barrier that physically and ideologically divided communist East Berlin from non-communist West Berlin from April 13, 1961 to November 1989, when it was finally demolished in 1992. The Wall is, 11, is the 11th studio album by the, progressive, by the British progressive rock supergroup Pink Floyd, conceived by bass guitarist and lyricist Roger Waters. That was, which was released on November 30th, 1979. Having seen Roger Waters as a solo artist perform The Wall at Wrigley Field, I consider The Wall to be one of the greatest rock albums of all time. Now, but now El Presidente Trump has given The Wall a whole new meaning, which has fueled the fire of those of, of us empowered to resist the Trump Pence administration. In the wild and wacky world of Donald Trump, this has come to mean that 1,200 mile-long monstrosity along the U.S.-Mexico border that the Mexican government is expected to pay for. Trump himself estimates $8 billion to construct his so-called big, beautiful wall. That's what he called it. Oh, oh, oh my goodness sakes. Oh, yeah. And the U.S. Department of Homeland Security estimates the cost closer to $21.6 billion. By his own executive order, Donald Trump's border wall will be exempted from all laws and environmental reviews so it can be built. How about that? I'm going to finish up with reading about the wall. A press release from Center for Biological Diversity from Tucson, Arizona, May 16th of this year. President Trump's border wall threatens 93 endangered and threatened species, including jaguars, ocelots, Mexican gray wolves, and cactus progenius pygmy owls, according to a new study by the Center for Biological Diversity. Construction of Trump's 1,200-mile wall, along with related infrastructure and enforcement, will have far-reaching consequences for wildlife, including cutting off migration corridors, reducing genetic diversity, destroying habitat, and adding vehicles, noise, and lights to vast stretches of the wild borderlands. I have a lot more to say. My time is up, but hopefully we'll have a chance shot to talk about some more okay. stuff. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is ready. Build the wall. There are more people Order. here uh, uh, tonight. Be here. Um, Come on, let's give the speaker a chance to speak. Go ahead. Everybody here is more articulate than I am about Trump. You know, I, I, I don't think there's anything that I can add except this. Can anybody tell me what this is? This is a gift to the college. 
It's tinfoil. It's something wrapped in tinfoil. Oh, yeah. No? Okay. Well, I came across this quite by accident. This is my speech. I'm donating, and everybody can have some. Oh, shit. <laughs> a roll of toilet paper oh, all right. uh, hey, to the college <laughs> to be framed or whatever with Donald Trump's picture on it. Oh, that's, my, that's my contribution. I'm going to give it to Mo. Take as many sheets as you want, but remember when you, you use it. You don't make selling that. No, I got it on Amazon. They made the money. How about Amazon? You get everything on Amazon. You think we could have and Trump so, sign each one of those? Tomorrow morning or afternoon or evening, when you decide to use the bathroom, take this and wipe you know what with it. Thank you. <laughs> I don't think Trump deserves this honor. All right. We have an open microphone. Our next speaker, please. You have 10 minutes. I told you I'm going to be the last one. All right. Order. Order. My name is Raj Patel. I've been told many times that uh, I have better English. I can be more effective with people when I speak. Mm. And I'll be more effective when I write, if I'm my, mm. my writing is better. Mm. And that is true. The, so, so far, speakers have been here. Uh, they've been good. They have yeah. lots, of, lots of information. But so the Hillary Clinton. She had a she knew everything. She knew how government works, what are the ins and out of issues, and do you know, she lost. And Donald Trump, whatever he is, he communicated. He speaks the language people can understand, and they did. Right now, whatever problem you might have with Donald Trump, do you support him? And those who oppose him, they do understand what he's talking about. There is no doubt about that. And do you know something, Barack Obama spent whole years to pass Obamacare. And do you know something, nobody's proud of that product. Here they are. Yeah, sure. Yeah, they are right. Yeah. Okay. Are. Some. The, the thing is they're running a government is tough. And uh, Trump comes with no experience. So he's taking some time. But do you know, <coughs> I have faith in a constitution. <coughs> I have enough faith in a structure of government. Sure. And it has worked very well so far. OK? I mean, you may not like something, one thing or other thing, you know. Bill Clinton, we spent lots of time with a whom he slapped and whom he forced himself upon. We spent lots of months. But do you know Bill Clinton government worked? His ideas work, and uh, he did a good job. Okay? Trump, so far, government, witness is happy. You can see from stock market, you see from the profit, you see from the new businesses coming up in technology and innovations, and you can see that. But we have to move on. The old values we have and what you are talking about and lots of people talking about are no longer valid. The idea job how society works, idea of uh, marriage, family, sex, have changed and changing very fast. What will be our lifestyle in a few years is changing very fast. If, if somebody right now is a 10 year old and he has to tell his grandchildren that uh, 
life will be so much change that he, that he will be wondered in studying history what happened now. And that is realistic. Let me, let me give you, let me, I'm not, cannot say every speak everything, but I'm going to speak some issues which bothers me and I think which can make substantial changes. Number one issue, number one in my opinion, is our relationship with Israel. That is number one issue for me. Because what happens there and what is happening in that, that relationship is against our values, is against our interest, is against the interest of the Middle East, is against the interest of the world. We should not have a problem lingering for 50, 60 years and we can keep people in a little hole locked up with no rights. That is not America. If America, America keep on supporting that right, that way, then we have a real problem in our values as people understand all over the world. People have a doubt about American values. And that is why, perhaps that is why Trump is there. Our, the, the, the so many white people demonstrated that they have lost the faith in our government. They have lost the faith in how we are guiding our same. We have a we are Democratic Party is supporting too much for the Jews, for the Latinos, for the blacks, for all minorities. And they forgot the who paid for all those things. That is the white people who pay. White people have to pay. And sooner or later, those white people who cannot make enough money, and they come to understand that they, they are suffering. They cannot pay the mortgage. They cannot send their kids to high school. A, a Jewish man can pay five million dollars very easily, lots of, lots of Jewish people, to Harvard University and get kid admitted, okay? Like a Jared Kushner did. His father, his father was smart, he did it, okay? Most white people, even they, when they have money, they are not so smart to do that. And we lost something. And that is very important. Second thing is Korea, North Korea. I have said before and I'm saying again, that we should, make, we should not have a problem with North Korea, we should make a friend with them, we, Okay, we should make a friend with them and uh, we should have a good relationship with them. Let China worry about it then. Then what the hell we are going to do in North Korea? Because then, friendly North Korea will have water with China. And that is the problem. They got rockets. Okay. So marriage, sex and children. You know, look. I mean, no matter what is it. I do not see, I see lots and lots of unhappy marriages. And that is not about beyond that divorce. And when them, it's not working. People's sex style is changing. People are not satisfied with the one person, one kind of sex all, all their life. And they're experimenting, they're going out. And, and this, is real, this is really happening, whether you like it or not. Okay? Children. There are so many children for broken marriages. And do you know, nobody cares for them. You know, because uh, some people care and they love and this thing, that thing, and then then daughter comes out and says, Dad, you know, I, got, I want to go to college, I do not have any money, can you help me? And Dad says, look, I, got, I married again and I got three children, and I don't, I cannot afford it. This is happening, really. I'm not, I'm not kidding you, I talk to so people. And this is what happening. The first marriage kids are screwed. Okay, this is happening. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> then other thing, I think we are living too long. 76 years is too, it's a too much of a too long a lifestyle. You know, our our our, our age longevity should be 70 years. Some people are healthy, they can live longer. But we have a people dying. We have people six, eight, nine months in hospital, in our nursery home, paying, causing lots of money, and they are suffering. I I I have a retirement home. One block from me, and do you know something? Good, very rich people there, living there. But their caretaker is the like I say. They're floating at them, okay? They curse them, and these are the employees. 
making 10, 10, 10, 12, 15 dollars an hour. Then get the great revenue. Then I tell you something. You get older and you do not have anybody, but you now you to take care of it. You are screwed. Your life is going to be in a hell. All right, okay. Raj, time. Time up. Thank you. All right, ten minutes. Ten minutes. How are you doing? Okay. You know, uh, uh, can I go ahead through this guy? Yes. Working in designing new equipment and things, and now I am confronted with a difficult problem that I would like to solve. I want to have a, a, a mechanism that will convert the voice that comes through this instrument when it's shed to rain shed all over all over the place. And I need some support for you. If you approve of the invention I will work real hard on that and uh, eventually I will ask ask for some support from you. If you if you agree that it should be done, I would like to have a, a good uh, applause. All right. Next, next, short and sweet. We like that. The microphone will transform the shit that's being spoken to it into real shit. No. It's the best. Yeah, I still want to make America great again. All right. Yeah, that will that will do it. Make America great again. Ten minutes, Mo. All right. The greatest danger that Trump presents is not his finger on the button. Rex Tillerson is much bigger than Trump. If Trump tries to put his finger on the button, he can stop him. Um, the targets, when we were, when we, uh, were in this duel with the Soviet Union for decades, they knew what the targets were. You know, I'm sure they had Moscow, what was then called Leningrad, etc. I hope they didn't have uh, Khmelnytsky. That was my parents' hometown in the uh, Ukraine. Um, but they, you can't press the button if the, if the missiles are not targeted. Now, frankly, I don't know where, what the, who, who the missiles are targeted on right now. Um, but there doesn't seem to be you know, you're going to try to blow up the whole Middle East and to, in order to prevent terrorism. So that's not the danger. What is the real danger of Donald Trump? The danger of Donald Trump is that we, when we get rid of him, we'll think we've solved our problems. That is the biggest mistake that we can make. Um, the corporate Democrats are more dangerous than Trump because with Trump, you see what you get. With the corporate Democrats, for instance, Obama was great on the environment. If Obama was so great on the environment, why did Stephen Hawking say just uh, I think about a, two months ago that we have a four-year uh, window to present total prevent total catastrophe? If, now, you could say, oh, the Republicans uh, stopped uh, Obama from doing something. I don't know what they stopped him from doing, but assuming that's true, Obama could have come to the nation like Truman used to do and say, those damn Republicans are preventing me from putting through this program or that program that would really uh, address global warming. He never did that. He didn't try to summon the nation to a fight. There is one guy who, who, there are two guys who tried to summon the nation to a fight that I know of. One of them is um, Warren Buffett. And he did it in about six words. That man is a genius. He said, the threat of global warming, maybe that's eight words, the threat of global warming is greater than the threat of the Japanese Empire's attack on Pearl Harbor. Think about that. I remember the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. I went to war <laughs> in Rogers Park, along with 
American population. I was selling war bonds door to door in the form of stamps of the civil little booklets. I was collecting scrap metal. Uh, everybody was doing something. We were rationing gasoline. You couldn't watch River McGee and Molly or Jack Ben or listen to them, I should say. You couldn't listen to them on the radio without hearing all kinds of announcements about the war. How many announcements do we hear about global warming? We are lame. We are failing. Donald Trump, Mao's a marvelous attack on the environment. But the really insidious attack is being uh, conducted by the corporate Democrats and by America asleep. Uh, who was it that wrote a book, uh, While England Slept? John F. Kennedy. John F. Kennedy. Okay. Yes, that's they say he and who was summoning them? to, uh, to uh, uh, build up their arms during the 30s, Winston Churchill. And they weren't listening, and he, he used in his influence to build up the RAF. If he hadn't done that, London would have been finished. There's one other person who is about as smart as Warren Buffett, and has also summoned us to a struggle. It's a guy that I think his name is uh, Mo Shanfield. Huh? I was on Channel 11 in the uh, campaign of 2008 as the Green Party candidate for Congress. I looked back at what we did in World War II. I wasn't quite smart enough to put that phrase that the threat of global warming is as great as uh, the threat of the, of, of the attack on Pearl Harbor. But I had the, I had the plan. Very simple. If you put it in 2017 dollars, in 1942, uh, uh, in the year following Pearl Harbor, the United States government spent or committed in 2017 dollars, this is after the, the Congress was saying we're broke, we can't spend any more money, they, said, they were saying they're right up to Pearl Harbor, seven and a half trillion dollars. And Roosevelt did that on purpose. He said we wanted to have uh, such an overwhelming military force that we wouldn't have great casualties. If you don't have, have, have enough tanks, a lot of the infantry will die. <clears throat> so I just said, let's apply uh, the seven and a half trillion dollars to this new war that we get. I didn't use that language. I wish I, I wish Warren Buffett had spoken first. I, didn't quite have it that sharp, but that's what I was saying. But we're not going to build uh, guns, tanks, planes, bandages, and boots. We're going to build uh, solar power, uh, wind power, and so forth. If, 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 if we had spent only $3 trillion, the problem would be in hand, and uh, Stephen Hawking wouldn't uh, have issues that morning. Um, so Obama is more dangerous than Trump. The Democrats are more dangerous than Trump because they're fooling us. We think Trump is the great enemy of the environment. Wrong. Obama was the great enemy. Hillary is the great enemy. All of the, most of the Democrats, maybe there's a few exceptions in Congress, are the great enemy. Because they're fooling us into thinking they have a plan that is going to solve the problem. That would be as if uh, Roosevelt, after Pearl Harbor, had said, uh, well, let's see, I think we might need a few tanks. Anybody know how to build tanks? I'll just say one, one, I'll say something positive now. Until Trump is, um, until we're rid of him, whether by impeachment or whatnot, there is one statesman in American history who shows us the way to control a, I don't know what to call it, a president out of control. Does anyone know who that was? Right after the Civil, uh, right, yeah, right after the Civil War. 
Andrew uh, Johnson. There was a book written by about uh, by a Harry Barnard who used to live up in Winnetka, who was published around 1940, called a Being Dark and Wise. Anyone know who that was? I thought what John Wilkes Booth. Thaddeus <laughs> Stevens, the leader of would you believe the radical Republicans? <laughs> there were radical Republicans. What does Daddy Stevens do to uh, Andrew Johnson? They knew that Andrew Johnson was dangerous because he, although he did a good job of fighting the Confederacy during uh, the war, he summoned up uh, the poor whites of uh, Tennessee to fight the uh, slave-holding aristocrats. He hated blacks. He was trying to undermine the, uh, uh, what do you call it, the restoration, the uh, reconstruction. reconstruction. Reconstruction, thank you. And he was a drunk. And Thaddeus Stevens, who really, Thaddeus Stevens, who really believed in reconstruction and helping blacks to, uh, to take good advantage of their new freedom, saw what Andrew Johnson was trying to do. They passed a law that prohibited the president from firing the very capable Union general who was heading the uh, uh, something that word uh, reconstruction. reconstruction. The law said that he, uh, uh, Johnson could not fire that guy until they, he submitted the, uh, the firing to a senatorial committee. Johnson very <laughs> very uh, unwisely went ahead and did it, and that was the prime grounds for impeachment. Well, you won't believe it, maybe you remember, there's a, a Republican committee, maybe a foreign relations committee in the Senate that initiated a, a new law that was passed just a, a couple of months ago that, were, that did the same thing with regard to the uh, the, the boycotts, what do you call it, the, uh, on the Russian goods, they, they have limits on, the, on what they can sell. And doesn't anybody know Sanctions. Huh? Sanctions. Sanctions. Well, that'll do it. The Republicans had followed in the footsteps of Thaddeus Stevens. And Trump cannot eliminate any of the sanctions on Russia uh, without consulting that committee first. Well, we can do the same thing with all the powers of the president, including the finger on the button. Trump cannot put the finger on the button without putting it to, well, let's say, an executive committee of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. So it should be done passing on the assumption that there are some rockets headed toward us. So, something has to be done to control Trump's power because the impeachment is not coming up soon. And there's a danger that he's going to call off the next election, just like they're calling me off now. All right, ten minutes. Well, a lot of people brought up some good points already. Uh, I wish I'd like prepared uh, um, a talk myself, but I'm just going to try to touch on some points uh, too. It's interesting that uh, uh, Mo that you brought that up uh, because that was one of the things I wanted to mention. Um, you know, I am representing here uh, partly an organization that uh, I'm kind of a member, although there is no official membership. It's basically anyone who is on board with uh, resisting. Um, a fascist uh, takeover of our government, um, and um, and uh, Don did a great job of uh, indicating that uh, Trump is definitely a fascist, and that uh, uh, we're pretty sure that Pence is too. Although he's had a, hmm? can everyone hear me? Yes. Yeah. We're pretty sure that Pence is too, but uh, yes. Um, um, we could reduce the danger that Trump. Uh, is um, um, showing off uh, that he could uh, start a nuclear war uh, if we 
and had Congress get a backbone, and, and somebody's already proposed a bill similar to what you talked about. Um, I don't know if it's actually been uh, uh, put into committee yet, or um, I think it's been written up, um, and I think it was sponsored by uh, a representative from Hawaii, I think. Uh, yeah, but um, that is hopefully something that will go through, but um, we're, we're faced with um, such an instability and a person that um, um, at times looks like he's crazy like a fox, but at other times looks like he's uh, just plain crazy. And um, um, one of the things that the organization that I'm with, Refuse Fascism, uh, website refusefascism.org, uh, has mentioned is that uh, we are doing this struggle of resisting uh, Trump, Pence, and other fascists uh, in the name of humanity also, not just um, uh, in a selfish way to try to protect ourselves in this country and uh, continue the, Amer the real American experiment. Um, Trump is a danger to the whole world, and um, that's why many people are uneasy, not only here, but in South Korea and many other countries, because he could start minute, something please. that uh, could lead to a third world war, and which would be nuclear. He's already said that he's willing to use nuclear weapons, or why can't we use them if we have them? The answer is obvious, that uh, uh, except for that uh, uh, use that our military was authorized to do uh, at the end of World War II. Nobody has, and thank goodness for that. We've come perilously close. So. And a number of times, um, the future of humanity really uh, uh, was uh, on a razor's edge or uh, uh, hanging by a slender thread. Um, there's instances of um, uh, the Lieutenant Colonel uh, when there was a glitch in the uh, Russian um, uh, the Russian uh, early warning system, uh, a computer was saying uh, not only once but so something like twice or Sorry. three times that missiles were approaching Russia from the United States, but he refused to actually send a recommendation to fire their own missiles. He, and he was maybe, uh, he's been called the person that saved the world. And his name escapes me because I didn't write down notes. but. Uh, uh, we also had a time on our side where we had uh, a uh, spurious uh, um, false uh, report uh, that the Russians were firing missiles. And it's only recently been revealed. I just heard that on MSNBC, I think, uh, recently. So uh, it's pretty bad when you have accidental things that can cause a nuclear war. And we've been on the verge uh, many times uh, since um, the 50s. Um, and uh, you have a person that actively promotes this kind of um, um, scary um, uncertainty. But uh, it's not just Thank that. Uh, that If Congress got a backbone, they could take control because um, Trump does not have the right constitutionally to start a war. He does not have the right to do that. And Congress could um, provide some way that either the Secretary of Defense or an executive committee of some kind or uh, some kind of uh, maybe a babysitter um, could at least get in between Trump and the button. Um, hopefully that'll happen. Um, now, the uh, subject of the talk was, uh, has Trump made America great again? <laughs> or should he be impeached? Well, I think um, my, from my standpoint, the answer is obvious. It would be better for us better for us to have Trump impeached and removed from office because of his instability and because of all of the fascist things that he represents and that we're pretty sure that Pence would also represent those kind of fascist um, policies and leanings. But Pence has a little bit more of a uh, um, seeming to be a rationality or uh, a better ability to, to calculate things or to restrain himself from um, uh, berserk, berserker type actions. Uh, but he, he would present other um, dangers. Uh, and it's been you know, suggested he would be much harder on, um, for example, our um, gay or transgender, or, um, you know, just 
people that uh, don't subscribe to Christian religion, um, he would discriminate against, which um, that would be a different kind of danger. It wouldn't be a danger to the entire world, but uh, we would be trading one danger for another. Um, we have um, grave dangers to our civil liberties, which I've mentioned here before a number of times. Uh, fascists, of course, um, I think Don mentioned it, um, but uh, you know they strive to uh, take control, become totalitarian. They want to control the news media, things like that. You see how um, he is doing it, just keeping on, you know, moving the bar as far as he can and uh, restricting um, uh, news media and presenting a completely false. Um, realm of alternate facts, whatever you want to call it, just plain lies. Um, this is what fascists do. This is kind of the playbook of Hitler. Um, Pence might do the same, but maybe we could hope that he wouldn't be as um, as um, aggressive in, in pushing that um, kind of an agenda forward. Now, refuse fascism has, you know, made a demand of that the Trump-Pence regime must go, but not exactly a coherent and complete plan of what uh, would come after it or uh, exactly um, how that would result. I mean, the assumption was that <coughs> embarrass them enough or cause them enough trouble that um, they both have to resign at once. And we all know, however, from the Constitution that Paul Ryan would take over. And nobody's mentioned his name yet here, but he would be a, another grave danger. It might be a different danger. He might go after uh, Medicare and Social Security more aggressively. Um, Trump, and, but mm. Trump hasn't yet gone after Social Security <laughs> or Medicare. It's kind of um, uh, just been on the verge of denying people the uh, Medicare ex Medicaid expansion and um, uh, killing Obamacare. Uh, it's all very complicated. Of course, you know, Trump can kill Obamacare uh, by neglect. It doesn't have to be through legislation necessarily. Uh, and that would be very dangerous for many, many people because many people would lose their lives by not having the access to health care that they have now. Um, it's a terrible thing. Pence would almost certainly do the same. Ryan would be even more aggressive probably in denying people health care. So um, this is a very, uh, even if you get rid of Trump, and so many people said it, you know, from the time, they, or even before the election, that that's what we'll be faced with. It's um, it's a terrible choice. So it's called a Hobson's choice or something. I don't remember exactly. But uh, uh, get rid of Trump. He's a danger to humanity. Uh, he's a danger to, to you know a nuclear war. Pence might be better in that respect, but he might be worse than others. So um, the best thing to do, in my opinion, I've uh, come upon this. I know people have occasionally suggested this, but uh, since we know now, and it's almost proven. It will be proven probably within the next couple of months by a um, Mueller invest investigation um, that uh, there was definite collusion. We could also call that treason. A uh, number of things that um, Trump has done uh, can be construed as treason, um, giving aid and comfort to our enemies. Russia is still an enemy. It used to be an enemy because it was communist. Now it's an enemy because it's oligarchic <laughs> and um, totalitarian. Extreme totalitarianism. So, um, and I would say that Pence uh, also colluded with that. So, I would say there could be an argument on two grounds uh, for a new election. Time. And uh, I would uh, prescribe that that would be the best thing to do because that would remove both uh, Trump and Pence. It would require uh, the Supreme Court, which still has the bare possibility, and remember our survival has sometimes been, been <laughs> responsible for one person, Anthony Kennedy. Um, it's possible okay. what we could do is bring a suit to uh, provide for a new election. Next. All right. The new election. David. Before I get down to the real uh, brass tags here, one of the speakers made a remark 
made some remarks earlier, in which he equated corporate Democrats, as he put it somehow, saying that they were just as bad as Republicans. Oh, no, worse. Republicans. They're, they're worse than the Republicans. They're worse. One fool at a time. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You're right. And I think that's, and I think that's all a lot of radical horseshit, plain and simple. To say that corporate Democrats somehow are are, are as bad or worse than Republicans is nonsense. And it's being said by people, Bernie or bus people, who were so busy trying to defend their principles that they were, it was more important to keep the principles and, than compromise, and as a result, it was more important that they have their principles than the country should go down the drain, which is what is happening. Plain and simple. The real <coughs> enemy was Donald Trump and what he represents. And it has been the, that it was the case all along. And what he represents isn't in some ways actually new. Those of you who watched the Ken Burns series on Prohibition that aired know that there's always been an element of nativist prejudice that arises from the small towns in this country and the rural areas. And it was those people who forced Prohibition on us in the first place. And it's the same kind of people today who are backing Donald Trump, who are busy marching around in Charlottesville, and who ran over that poor, that poor woman in Charlottesville. And to, say, and to say that somehow corporate Democrats are worse? Oh, come on, horse hockey. And with regard to the comments about Andrew Johnson and the impeachment, the passage of the Tenure of Office Act wasn't done to protect people running the Freedmen's Bureau. It was done to protect the Secretary of War, Edward Stanton, with whom President Johnson had many sharp differences. Now, I have some sharp differences with President Johnson myself, but you don't get to impeach the President simply because you happen to disagree with him, which is essentially what Congress was trying to do. And the Tenure of Office Act was eventually found unconstitutional in the Supreme Court decision 20 years later. The president has the right to fire people who do not do what he tells them to do. And that includes the Secretary of War and his modern equivalent, the Secretary of Defense. And it includes any of the other presidential appointees. And he should not be saddled, or eventually he will not be saddled, with people that he disagrees with, people that he disagrees with and won't cooperate with him. What's the purpose of having a president? If we had had an impeachment, we would have had a parliamentary style government. Some people, of course, favor that. I do not. Bottom line here is, and yes, I think that I think in theory that Donald Trump should be impeached. I'm not entirely sure what good it would do because, as Doug has pointed out, Mike Pence has his own liabilities. Although he's probably a more stable guy than Trump, for one thing. And if you got rid of Pence, well, that would put Paul Ryan in the White House. He's probably more stable than either one of them. But that's not saying a whole hell of a lot. Besides, what do you expect from a cheese head anyway? All right, next. Here. Oh, you want to go first? No, 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 you, I already went. You go. Okay. All right. Ten minutes. It would be one of the easiest things in the world right now, based on what has already happened with our president, to either put together articles of impeachment or invoke the 25th Amendment, which allows for the removal of a president who can no longer perform the job and who may uh, have exhibited uh, numerous examples of mental unbalance. I think, I think there's enough evidence there, but that's not the issue. We could get rid of Trump, and probably will, within the next year. Problem is, as some other speakers have pointed out, if we, if we get rid of Trump, we have Oliver Cromwell, Jr., who, make no mistake, 
If he is president, he will be an entirely different type of fascist. Uh, one who will try to turn this country into a theocracy. Uh, seriously. Every man is entitled to his own religious views. But when he is in a position to, and he shows every sign of imposing his religion on everyone else, there then becomes a problem. England went through a bloody civil war in the 1640s over precisely that. For those of you who may not have read that chapter in English history, we do not want to have a repeat of that. 10% of the males in England died during those four years. It was bloodier than the American Civil War, and we're still suffering from the wounds of that war in many respects. We would have to get rid of, legally, we would have to find ways of getting rid of Trump. We would have to find ways of getting rid of the vice president. And certainly, I think most of us would be in agreement that we would not want to have uh, the current Speaker of the House as the President of the United States. Uh, so it's a complicated thing. It can't be done. Uh, I'm sure there are people, responsible people, thinking of that. But there's one other thing that we have to keep in mind. Donald Trump did not become President of the United States simply because he wanted to be President of the United States. Donald Trump became President of the United States because both the Democratic Party and the mainline Republican Party had broken faith with the American people. And consequently, a lot of people felt so desperate that they had to turn to this individual who, if you listen to some of his statements, and you listen to some of the behaviors during his rallies, smelled an awful lot of what was going on in the beer halls in Munich and other places in the early 1930s. I'm not an alarmist. I'm not saying that, you know, we, we, we should all uh, <coughs> go into uh, paroxysms of hysteria. I do think, however, we have to realize that if we are going to make America great again, and I like that slogan, it's too bad he pirated it, we can make America great again, but we have to regain our own self-confidence in ourselves, in our country, and in our leaders. Until we reach that point, we run the risk of having every two-bit demagogue, every failed soapboxer, to get up and gather around him uh, some kind of a following. We have to look deeply at what is the American dream. What is our obligation as a nation to ourselves and those who live under our flag? We have to think in terms of becoming truly great again. And this means, this means bringing back the promise of the American dream that anyone who wishes to work and work hard can in fact achieve a level of uh, prosperity. Now, what has happened is that a number of businesses, mega corporations, including those owned by the current president, Donald Trump, have sold out their dreams by turning their factories in, uh, overseas. Consequently, a large number of skilled Americans have no place to go. It's brother, can you spare a dime again in many parts of this country. We have to look at how we have been treating our own people. We have to look at how we have been treating uh, American industry. We have to realize that uh, uh, moving factories over to Taiwan or Indonesia or China, many of those factories incidentally are owned and run by the Chinese army, 
uh, using child labor. Uh, we have to look at those things. And we have to say, is this the kind of an economy we want to be tied up with? I think most people in this room would give a resounding no, no. to something like no. that. No. We don't want that. That's not what we're about. And we're not going to be getting anything resembling the true American dream, the true opportunities that we have grown to expect in this country, that many of our forefathers, those of our forefathers who weren't in a hurry to escape the hangman's noose of the countries that they fled from, uh, who came here for a dose of prosperity not possible in the old country, we're going to find that in order to restore that, we have to restore healthy American businesses. Now, I am not, I am not a, uh, well, yeah, I believe in capitalism, but I believe in capitalism like everything else, subject to uh, control uh, of the body politic, subject to control of the people. I'm not a socialist, but I believe there are many socialist ideas that have already been incorporated into our ways of doing business here. And as a matter of fact, one of the greatest, what some call socialism, one of the greatest acts of socialism, if you want, that turned thousands, millions of people into the American middle class was when the President of the United States, after World War II, signed the GI Bill, enabling millions of men and women to go to college, become professionals, become educated, and become uh, prosperous in ways that would not have been possible under the old way of doing things. Many doctors, lawyers, many people that we probably owe our lives to, who saved us in operating rooms, learned their skills because they were able to go to medical school or dental school. Or maybe, maybe they saved our ass when we were in court and needed help and needed skilled help from people who learned their craft thanks to the GI Bill. And that was, that was considered very socialistic at the time. But look what it did for the country. These are the kinds of things that we have got to get back to. Instead of politicians asking what is good for our party, they have to realize that our party, whatever that party is, can only be saved if it serves the needs of the people. How many people did not vote in this last election and how many people voted for Donald Trump, not because of the fact that they particularly liked the guy. I know several people who voted for Donald Trump but said they were going into the polls and they were going to be holding their noses while they did it because he seemed like the only one that offered any kind of a solution. Now. If you look back about 50, 60, 70 years and you talk to people who lived in Germany at that time, they will tell you, I was not a Nazi. I just thought that this was the only hope that we had. And on the other side of the coin, after World War II, why did so many uh, parts of Europe I'm talking about in Italy, I'm not talking about the Soviet bloc. In Italy and other countries, suddenly have communist mayors and communist governors because of the fact that they felt the communists were the only ones with some kind of a program. We need to expect our elected officials to know not only how to get elected, my daughter's dog could probably do that just by being charming, we need to have people who know what they are going to do the morning after when they are not going to be sitting in the West Wing and they're turning around looking at each other saying, now what do we do? What do we do next? No. Trump has been called a fascist. I question that. He would like to be a fascist, but see, effective fascists know exactly what they're doing. 
They know what they're going to do the day they miss their first steps in that office. Trump, it was rather clear, had the foggiest notion what he was doing. And incidentally, if Mr. Trump has any uh, agents listening here, I will be perfectly happy to stand by my remarks uh, uh, any day of the week. Because I think what I'm saying is echoing the feelings of just about every American. No. Republican, even the Republicans, even the Republicans are, are uh, uh, moving away from this guy. But getting rid of Trump is not the only answer. We have to get rid of the others with him, and we have to do that constitutionally. And as a matter of fact, I have just been warned that... <laughs> Thank you. Hat for Congress! Hat for Congress! Hat for President! <laughs> Watch out, there's a big black. There's a big black car at the car. I think you just stole my thunder because most of my rebuttal was going to be based on exactly what you had said. That we have no one to blame for Trump but ourselves. All right. We elected him. We were supposedly bamboozled by the media. We can go ahead and blame everybody else for the election of Donald Trump. But I honestly think when it comes down to is when you go into the ballot box, you pull that lever, and you go with a, a certain candidate. You have to remember, too, we had other candidates besides Hillary and Donald Trump. We had, we had uh, Jill Stein, and we also had Libertarian Gary Johnson. I about Bernie. Bernie could have ran, too, if he'd have started a new party. You see, it's up, fool me once, what is it Lincoln said? Fool, you, uh, it's, you can fool the American people once and get away with it. Fool me twice, you're kind of crazy, but don't get fooled a, for a third time. As it says in the Who song, we don't get fooled again. Meet the new boss, same as the old boss. Same as the old boss. Lincoln, too, was also maligned in his support for the Civil War. Many wanted peace with the Confederacy to cut down on the killing. But Lincoln was abject in his resolve to end slavery and knew that he may not be having a popular stance. The President Trump, however, is, is limited somewhat in what he can and cannot do. And I think our democracy is functioning just like it should when he's had his uh, health care reform stopped dead in its tracks by one vote, when his travel ban went to the courts. We're starting to see the levers of government working. We still have free elections and a free press. And that's something that we need to embrace and learn. Remember, we have been here before. The election of 1800 after uh, Washington left office. I think it was, somebody will know this, the 1800 can presidential candidates. What happened Thomas in 1800 Jefferson was that and Adams and Jefferson it went to the House and it was a tie not between Adams and Jefferson, but between Jefferson and Burr, the two Democratic Republican candidates. And the House elected Jefferson after Hamilton threw his votes behind Jefferson. Okay, thank you for the clarification. But what I'm, what I'm simply saying is, we've been here before, and the presidency was thrown into the House elections. At that time, they had pamphlets and newspapers. Today, we have blogs and Facebook and TV and other media. And remember, it's not always the candidate. The world has also changed quite a bit. We've speeded up a lot since 1800. If you just take a look at things like Moore's Law, the faster and quicker processing of information, the climate change we are going through, and the faster pace of globalization that's around us, sometimes we can't control those changes that are coming around in this world. 
America used to do great things. We put a man in the moon. We united against things. After Sputnik, we decided to put science back into the American schools and really revitalized our nation. When good people do nothing, evil happens. I'll conclude with this. America has a formula for prosperity. Both democratic. One of that is investment, high investment in public education, an investment in infrastructure, a spirit of innovation and risk, and to take care of those who are left behind. Somehow, I think, since about the 1960s, we've gotten a lot more self-centered about ourselves. We've neglected caring about others. And I think we need to get back to a simple thing that it even says in the gospel, love thy neighbor as thyself. Or as the Beatles put it, all you need is love. Maybe it sounds corny, but a genuine, a genuine caring about others other than yourself might be the best way to proceed forward with this country. I love you. Great. I love all of you. Okay, um, I had no idea what we were going to talk about until we walked in. I thought we were going to do the, the thing on the Illinois Labor Society, or I mean, Illinois Labor History Group. Um, but I guess I would like to call out the racism and anti-Semitism that was implied in the talk of Mr. Patel. And um, I, I, because it really was. And um, I think he was trying to say that, you know, we have to get back to the idea of, of marriages and change and all that. And our fearless leader is on his third marriage. And in the first two marriages, he was openly uh, had girlfriends in addition to his wife. So I think um, if we want to talk about the sanctity of marriage, we really cannot look at our president. The second thing I want to say is that um, people have not talked about the anti-woman anti uh, agenda that has also to do with racism and anti-Semitism and homophobia and all these things that the uh, right-wing people are doing. And it, it's all, in, in my opinion, it's because of this religious thing that's going on because many, uh, because the right wing Christian religions are supporting this anti woman, they want to deny women reproductive health care, which means they're denying them the capability of participating as equal members in this society if they deny women reproductive care and if they deny them abortion rights. They're denying, they're, they're racist, and so that people tolerate somebody saying that, that blacks are lazy and all that other bullshit. When, when the reality of history in this country is that it was built on slave labor for the first 200 years. Here, here. And then after slave, slavery was outlawed in 1865, and after the Reconstruction, which was 10 years of actual physical occupation of the South by Union troops to prevent the overt abuses of slavery, Jim Crow and the Ku Klux Klan came into existence and black people were again <coughs> oppressed and denied the right to vote and, and uh, forced into poverty. And the, uh, the poverty that they were forced into, the profits of that poverty was reaped by our society. And we were all, we all colluded in that. All of us here, in essence, have profited from the racism that's happened in the past in this country and from the, the, uh, the, the oppression of, uh, of, of people of color and women for that matter. So um, I think that that's something that the, um, that the, the uh, Trump administration has allowed to crawl out of the woodwork 
of service? This is made more obvious. This racism and, and homophobia, anti-Semitism, and the, the, uh, the uh, anti-Muslim and, and all of this religious bullshit that's going on. It's, they've allowed that to crawl out of the woodwork and be confirmed in society and confirmed by the people in this country. And so and, and so people like pay, oh yeah, 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 yeah. And they don't, we need, one of the things that James Baldwin said in his movie, I Am Not Your Negro, was until we face the problems, until we really look at them, we are not going to be able to deal with them. And so we're, uh, Amer my, one of my favorite thoughts is that America's uh, defense, its favorite defense, and they talk about ego defenses if your ego is threatened, is denial. And we have denied and denied and denied, and we, and we continue to do it. And if we don't face it, it's going to turn around to bite us in the ass, and that's exactly what's happening. has said we have a free press. We still have a free press in the United States. Well, the only free press that exists is websites on the internet that have no corporate advertising. People are risking their lives to run those sites and try to get some reality-based information out to the public. The, the mainstream press has no investigative reporters anymore that investigate what's really going on. Like, uh, who was it? Daniel Ellsberg. Uh, the, the last time we had an investigative reporter that you know leaked the Pentagon Papers, and they were, they covered it. Today, if you leak something like that, you get arrested and prosecuted, like in the Obama administration with Bradley Manning, who is now Chelsea Manning. Edward Snowden was prosecuted for uh, leaking the truth of what our our intelligence communities are doing. Number one. Um, I'm going to cover some things that the media is not covering uh, in reality in contrast to uh, some of the things that were said uh, people still believe in certain mythology in this country. First thing is Trump, Donald Trump is not the uh, duly elected president of the United States. He was not elected. He lost the popular vote and he lost the electoral vote. And the machines, voting machines, were changed in three states after we went to bed. They changed the vote count to stick Trump in office because he was much more attractive to corporate billionaire predators than Hillary Clinton would have been. That's number one. Number two, I praise Donald Trump because he's the best choice for America right now because he's like a, a wake-up call where we're a whole bunch of frogs being dumped into boiling water and you jump out. Uh, many, many analysts have said that if Hillary Clinton were elected, we would have had eight more years of what's called the Democratic billionaires uh, dominating uh, the environmental issues and everything else, where it would have been too late, way too late, to do anything to prevent 
catastrophic climate change in this country in the next 30 or 40 years. <clears throat> There's no way we could have tolerated eight more years of what Hillary Clinton would have given us. Number three, many people have been looking at the freak show of North Korea, uh, media portraying the threat of North Korea uh, firing nuclear missiles at America. Well, nuclear missiles as delivery vehicles for nuclear weapons have been obsolete since 1975. Nuclear missiles are as obsolete for delivering weapons as old eight-track tapes are obsolete for delivering music. We have CDs, iPods, eight-track tapes were obsolete, what, 30, 35 years ago? In 1975, on Union Oil property in Los Angeles, the nuclear emergency search team quietly conducted a search with their white vans and Geiger counters and sensors traveling through uh, the property on Union Oil, searching for an implanted portable atomic bomb. And the decision was made in November 1975, don't tell the American people that we're hunting for implanted bombs until the day we can't fuse one, uh, uh, defuse it before it goes off. When we lose a chunk or all of a third city, then we got to admit there's a problem with nuclear power because that's where the bomb material comes from. Forty years of that. It's one of the reasons that nuclear power, all forms of it, are considered a very, very large crime against humanity. But, but why are the missiles obsolete? Missiles are obsolete. Uh, missiles are obsolete because since 1975, the satellites that sense different kinds of things have gotten more sophisticated, better cameras. We have satellites now covering the Earth that can read a license plate from orbit. So they can see if anybody launches a missile toward the United States or any one of our territories, that's, that's a nation that's saying, hey, we want to commit suicide. That's like going out to your nearest police station with uh, a whole bunch of policemen and just pull a gun and point at one of the policemen and threaten to kill them. They will blow you away in a heartbeat. And that's what would happen if anybody launched a missile up into the air. The satellites will see it right away. They'll know exactly where it came from. And we launch a counterattack and wipe that country out. Why didn't they see the planes on 9-11? Uh, Charlie says, why did he see the planes on 9-11? Well, uh, we'll be talking about that in two weeks. Uh, there's a debate. There's a big debate on what kind of planes on 9-11 actually flew into the towers, whether they were plane events or something else. But there's overwhelming evidence that the event known as 9-11, the official story, is false. We'll be talking about the reality that's been built up with hundreds of thousands of scientists, intelligent people all over the world. Uh, if any of you are interested in the reality of what happened on 9-11 and you want to get out of the bubble of ignorance you've been living in, uh, come here two weeks from tonight and we'll have literature with summaries of hundreds of books, thousands of articles. It's like a database on what's known about asbestos or cigarette smoke. There's no, no debate on these things anymore. The answer is known, but it's being covered up by the press. In, in 1967, the Atomic Energy Commission published a study saying that we would have only one reactor accident per 1,000 years of service. And they expected we'd have 1,600 reactors running on American soil by the year 2000. And uh, at that conference, uh, somebody asked, what does that mean? Well, he said, you have to think about 33 years from now, the public is going, America is going to be overpopulated enough that the public is just going to have to get used to one blast a year and a few thousand dead in exchange for cheap electricity. Those people thought we would absorb one Chernobyl per year on American soil in exchange for cheap electricity. 1983, along comes Thomas K. Jones from Boeing Aircraft, T.K. Jones. His job as Under Secretary of Defense for Nuclear Operations would just fly around the country and have meetings with business leaders and say, there's no problem with nuclear war as long as every American has his own shovel and can dig his own fossil. With enough shovels, we're all going to make it. 
the doctors who form physicians for social responsibility, they stopped playing golf on Wednesdays, and they started combating this kind of insanity. They referred to Thomas K. Jones as insanity on the hoof, prime beef as it were. He's not in, in an asylum, in a state asylum somewhere being treated for his mental illness. He's in the president's cabinet. So these kinds of insane people that believe things that are so far out of touch with observable reality that they qualify for a definition of insanity, they populate now the modern Republican Party. And the Republican Party for the last 20 years has been quietly weeding out anybody with ethics, morals, or a conscience. That's where we are today. Trump is, is not the problem. He is a wake-up call. 9-11 uh, was made possible by 40 years of the media maintaining Americans in a bubble of ignorance with, so that you had no investigative reporters. So when, when the event of 9-11 was created and sold to us created by the Bush Cheney administration and then sold by the media, Americans accepted it because they thought, well, uh, the media is, uh, we have a free press, they, they're, they're covering the reality. When in reality, as Professor Griffin said in his 11th book, the evidence of 9-11 can be understood by a seventh grader with a 30% open mind. If you graduated beyond seventh grade and you still believe in 9-11, in the official myth, then you're maintaining yourself in a bubble of offensive ignorance. That's well, all, all there is to it. it is well, I guess I did then. Well, you do yeah, people, like the, pe the people, I'll say this, the people that uh, support Donald Trump fall in one of two categories. Either people that are certifiably insane or people that are incredibly, terrifyingly ignorant of what Donald Trump is and what he's doing. If you like Donald Trump, you have to support the pedophile priests who are doing a good job molesting our kids. One minute, Andy. It's the same kind of moral and ethical consideration. One minute, Andy. Okay. didn't get involved in that. You know, as I said, uh, Trump, Trump is not the problem. Trump is like one branch on a poisonous tree that was planted on 9-11. Before 9-11, we didn't have Homeland Security. We didn't have the Patriot Act. We had Fourth Amendment rights. Uh, you know, people could speak out without worrying about getting elected. As, as one author said, after, right after 9-11, Senator Russ Feingold, put a hold on the Patriot Act. Uh, you know, senators can hold up a bill. Dick Cheney dumped it on and said, pass this. Senator Russ Feingold said, uh, we want to read it before we pass it. That same day, they suspect that anthrax letters were mailed to the two Democratic senators, Patrick, Tom Daschle and Patrick Wade. The only two Democrats on the committees that were really holding up the Patriot Act, they got anthrax letters in the mail. And then, one year later, in 2002, the only senator that voted against the Patriot Act, Russ Feingold, was assassinated 10 days before the election. This is why Democrats, the Democratic Congress just lay flat on the floor for six years until 2006 because they collectively said, the Bush-Cheney administration is not made up of politicians. We're dealing with killers here. And this is where our country is. Trump is just the latest symptom of this. And we have to go after the cause, the poisonous tree that was planted in this country on 9-11 and then sold to us by a fully corrupt corporate media. So for corporate, uh, the last point I'll make is, if you're in the media, basically you have to have a college degree, college education to have a job in mainstream media. So what does it say about all of our people in the mainstream media on the subject of 9-11? They stand out there by their actions and say, I'm dumber than a fifth grader. I can't understand any of these facts that a fifth grader can understand. That's where we are today. Charlie, you had a question? Yeah, how many people will have been arrested under the Patriot Act? A bunch. People have you protested. Huh? A bunch? Uh, yeah. Uh, whistle, uh, Obama, under the Patriot Act and Homeland Security, uh, Obama prosecuted and put in prison more whistleblowers than all the previous administrations going back 200 years.
that's what we've done. Of course, the press has not those been covering this at all. Those are leaks. Yeah. Well, uh, they're they're talking, but see, without the Patriot Act and Homeland Security, these people couldn't be prosecuted. No, we have a free no. press, like Daniel Ellsberg. They're Daniel Ellsberg right. would be in jail today if we if he if he was living under the, the terms that we have now with the Patriot Act and Homeland Security. So Bernie is right. You said and this is not about Bernie Sanders. If somebody said here, it's about millions of us. Each of us, 300 million of us, have one. 300 million of the responsibility. This is our government, our country. It's a great, great country. I want to take it back from the criminals that are running it. Thank you. All right. All right. Well done. All right. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Ten minutes. Give our country back. <laughs> Make sense. All right, Andy. There, I think we got a good uh, new topic for you. Is uh, investigating these uh, murders by, you know, Obama people and by uh, Bush Cheney people. I'd like to know more about that because there have been a bunch of murders, strange murders around Washington D.C. Uh, anyway. Um, Making America Great Again by Trump. I really don't think he expected to win. And I think he's flying by the seat of his pants. And I think we gotta all take it with a grain of salt. So there's all your cliches. I think he just says stuff that comes off the top of his head that are there for just his own self-entertainment. So uh, I don't think he's gonna do anything that stupid um, and if he does, he won't be reelected in um, four years, three and a half years. Because if we're going to impeach him, it's going to take like two years to impeach him. Why do you bother with that? And then the options are not that good if you impeach him. So, you know, so just as long as uh, we keep track of what he's doing and, and it's the responsibility of the uh, media, which is, uh, of course, the corporate media is going to be useless, that's just happy news and selling pharmaceuticals, but the other media outlets, it's their responsibility to keep track of Trump and the Republicans and, and, and make sure they're calling them out on uh, bad policies and bad decisions. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and enough of the, you know, wisecracking, negative, you know, making fun out of Trump's looks, and all that stuff, and the stupidest stuff he says, he's going to say stupid stuff. And no if we focus on all that crap, you know, people, the, we're not, you know, it's not going to help the uh, left-wing cause and the progressive causes and, and, the, and the right things to get done. So I think um, people are overshooting the, the negativity towards Trump. Um, I'm going to give him a, 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 a chance, kind of. He's done some stupid things. I'm not a Trump supporter, uh, but I think he could turn around, especially if Democrats win next November. And um, I think he might wisen up. He's clearly unqualified for president. He clearly is, doesn't know what he's doing. He's learning on the job. He says stupid stuff. He might have dementia. I who knows? <laughs> you know, it, it's kind of the cards were dealt. I'm actually the, prepared to believe that. <laughs> but we we just got to make sure to call him out on important stuff. That's what a typical Sox stuff. fan does. Huh? That's what a typical Sox fan does. What's that? Learn on the job. Kind of does things fumbling around. Well, I mean, you know, we've all been there, so Trump's there now. So, uh, you know, what the hell? What does he do? He's a developer. He knows construction projects. He, he's a brand manager. He knows resorts, golfing, hotels. That's all he knows. And he's a good salesman. He sold half the country, or almost half the country. You know, so that's that's all he knows. He's nothing special. I mean, he was half-handed a. You know, half a billion, half a billion dollars in today's money. From if you family. withdraw the chance you're giving him, what would you do then? Go out and buy the rope for the lynching? 
I don't just hope he doesn't do anything stupid and wait four more years and wait two more years for the Democrats to take control and then uh, maybe he'll play ball with the Democrats. But the, I don't have a lot of faith in the Democrats. I think, you know, guys like um, Hillary brings this milk toast guy named Kane is a, is a, you know, some, some um, you know, Peace Corps volunteer. You know, the Democrats two are, huh? Two minutes. Left? Two minutes, Two minutes left. I've been talking for eight minutes? Yes. Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> really? Yeah. Uh, we'll give you two to three minutes, Raj. Any more rebutters? What? All right, Raj, make it about a minute or so. You haven't gone yet, have you? All right. He, he hasn't gone yet, but let, let him go first. Then we'll start, then we'll start doing some quick wrap ups. Can I go again, too? I have to say something about what we're going to say. Let 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 uh, the guy who hasn't spoke go here. first, yeah, I mean, I so. Come on. and then we'll do thirty seconds quick. How many minutes I get? You got ten, but I'd prefer you don't go all that long. Uh, dear friends of Slim Brundage, seekers of the truth, one and all, and find that a new facet of truth to improve the quality of life. <clears throat> what have we learned today to improve the quality of life? Uh, it's dump the Trump. It's, it's oh so easy to dump on Trump. Oh so easy. Yeah. And he's only in there for about seven and a half months or so. Give him a little time. And, uh, and uh, see, I got that. I'm blind out his one eye. I can't see too much on this one. I'm a walking wound. Uh, and then you come say out that uh, all priests are, as if all priests are only molesters. And molesters all over the field. I get three minutes. Not only three. Okay, three today. Uh, second round. Okay. Well, I'll speak about yesterday. I don't think I'll ever forget yesterday. I was waiting for a bus, and I saw two or uh, three wheel cars, two, uh, side by side, uh, on Western and um, Edison. <clears throat> and last week, the Pat Butler came up with a tremendous statement that uh, his grandfather, uh, your grandfather, huh? Pat. Uh, what about my... Yeah, was your grandfather that uh, yeah. was safe from being killed? Well, uh, my great-grandfather... Your great-grandfather, yeah, to, okay. Had yeah, to yeah. Leave Ireland. His great-grandfather had to leave uh, Ireland. Uh, a compassionate policeman That's said, Pat, surprising. pack up, to, uh, get out of town, because tomorrow the police are coming to, to do you in. And if, if that compassionate uh, uh, policeman didn't do that, we won't have Pat here today. The same like thing for me. Uh, my mother was engaged to a guy named Henry, and he got killed in an auto accident. If he didn't get killed in the auto accident, I would never be here. Police never came to my house. Okay, uh, it, uh, it's oh so easy to dump on Trump. Uh, and also last week, somebody mentioned about uh, Carl Schurz saying, uh, America, uh, right or wrong, it's America. If, if right, make it uh, better. If wrong, make it okay. America, right or wrong. And you say that uh, Trump is a racist and a, a anti-feminist, I, I believe he's got a, a Ben Carson, is he, is he on a, his, uh, he, he's some, he shows Ben Carson for something, and there's, I think a woman on the, his, uh, uh, Oh, that's true, it's a lot. Uh, uh, okay, uh, he's got you, you pray, for, you, you, you want a nun, uh, lawyer, all the pr presidents been lawyer, I think uh, Eisenhower probably was not a lawyer. They're all lawyers, and now you got what's that? They're not a lawyer, and you're uh, bitching about it. And you say that Trump uh, doesn't have any, uh, if he was a fascist, somebody mentioned he's more liberal than you think. A fascist would have a program. He doesn't have any program. And he wears his tie low, below his belt, to say that, to say that he's got uh, testicles. He insults everybody. Republicans, you better be careful. So then, uh, 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 in some, uh, too many of the Republicans are he'll be impeached. But I don't, I don't think he will be impeached. And last week they said, uh, uh, will he be, uh, will he resign? I don't think he'll resign. And uh, but somebody bringing up toilet paper. Now if he did that in some other country like Russia, next day he'd be a stiff. We get toilet paper with uh, Trump uh, on toilet paper. And uh, somebody mentioned about uh, a theocracy. Pat, was that you mentioned about theocracy? Yes. 
Uh, yes, I well, use the I use the word. Yeah, yeah. He, 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 he had somebody like a Pat Robinson, Robertson. <laughs> he bring a theocracy here. And uh, I mentioned uh, about uh, Thomas Aquinas. He said uh, he's, Thomas Aquinas is one of ten top men of uh, of all time. Thomas Aquinas. The whole Catholic Church built upon the Aquinas and Saint Paul and Saint Peter, of course. Okay. And. Uh, who are the uh, who are the top ten people of all time? Is there a woman on the top ten people of all time? Eleanor one, Roosevelt. Eleanor Roosevelt. She was. I think um, Mother the top okay. uh, first half of the twentieth century. She was voted the woman of the first half of the twentieth century, and I said a man. But I think that um, uh, Madame Curie should have been over Eleanor Roosevelt. Roosevelt. What nation here on earth here could c compete with? Uh, Nicholas Copernicus and Madame Curie, a male and female. What nation? Can you think about it? Okay. What nation can compete with uh, Thomas or with um, okay. Nicholas Copernicus and uh, Madame Curie? Okay. I, in the interest of time, because we're starting yeah, to get things, uh, I'd like the since you. Boston? Yeah. Well, okay. Well, I don't have it. I'm, I'm never organized. You voted about the black. I asked a fellow about two weeks ago, a black guy. Did he vote for Hillary or? Um, Hillary, he says, no way. He wants his country to be his, his, his country. With Hillary, you, you, you get a United States of uh, North and Central America, Canada, U.S. and Central America be one country. That's what your, your TV's got no, French, English, and Spanish. Okay. <laughs> Let's try to wrap it up, okay? Okay. Now, uh, no, now uh, ten top words. You will all have to speak Long will probably be the top ten word. Or I hang you by your ball. And actually, um, <laughs> just the other day, I, read, I thought you know, everybody seeks um, <laughs> happiness, but we should seek service. If you if you want to live to be a hundred years old, you should uh, volunteer for service. And uh, actually, okay, uh, service is love made up manifest. <laughs> service. All right. All right. We're have, all right, we're, yeah. we're going to cut you off. Yeah. You're know, rambling. Frog. Now you say about the frog in boiling water. All right, Andy. We, we, what? We have some other. We're getting low on time. I know. I got more stuff. Uh, a frog in hot water under. We've heard that one already. We've heard it. Let's uh, let's let's. Uh, we have four people who I'm going to give 30 seconds each, and we got to get. Give me 10, 10 minutes. Uh, it would have been nice had you been articulate, but. Uh, well, I, I, I'm not so articulate as our Sir Charles the Great over yeah, maybe it's Charlemagne. It. Life is unfair. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. it's just we're trying to keep with the restaurant. We are created for service, not not, not really happiness. Life is frog. And a, a, a frog in, in, under a tyrant or a fascist. Yes. In hot water, he'll jump out. But under a, a, a liberal, a frog will get his goose cooked. Doesn't know he's in hot water under socialism. And they said, which, which would you rather, uh, socialism or, or a fascism? Or none of the above. Somebody said none of the above. It's, it's better be under fascism because you know what's going, on, what's happening. Under socialism, you don't know what's happening. The water gets hotter and hotter, and the frog gets his goose cooked. Tim. Thank you. All right. What we're going to do? What I we're have going a 15 second update here. I, I misread the name. Uh, it was Senator Russ Feingold that put the hold on uh, the Patriot Act, and then the anthrax letters went out that day to uh, Tom Daschle and Patrick Leahy. The senator that got assassinated was. Uh, Paul Wellstone, he was the conscience of the Senate, and they assassinated him 10 days before the election in 2002 to take back the control, 51 to 49, so they could maintain criminal domination of the Senate in the, in the Bush-Reagan years, so, uh, uh, you know, Bush, uh, Bush okay. Cheney. So sorry about the mis mistransposition of those two words. Uh, Russ Feingold is still with us. Uh, Senator Patrick, uh, okay. Senator uh, Paul Wellstone was the one that was assassinated. Thank you. Okay. Well, for 30 seconds to one minute, please. I need to respond to say. It's about. What am I going to say? It's 8:36. We're trying I, to get moving. I, 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 want, I want you all to know. I mean, for the last two years, a couple of Jewish guys, okay, made my life hell under the auspices of this forum. And I complained to this forum, you know, and do you know something? 
it did not go on for a long time. So don't call me about anti-Semitic. Okay? And uh, finally, somebody helped from this and we solved the problem. And the one guy stopped coming, another guy it now doesn't, doesn't assault me. Second thing, okay, I do, I, I do not have problem with Jewish people. Oh. And I'm not anti-Semitic. Only, only this why I disagree with them, mainly it's Israeli and Palestine. But otherwise, I have a right to disagree on an issue. That doesn't mean I disagree with one issue, I become anti-Semitic. Second thing, okay. okay, on a women's thing, it's not, it's not that all women are one, one kind. 50% of the women like to live with their husband and don't want to believe in a liberal thing, fine. And 50% want to believe in their city and outside areas, that, that, that's the biggest thing that problem, okay? okay? Thank all you. Right, Raj. All, all right, right. Let's react to those. Mo, did you, you want to say something? Yes. Yeah. All right, get up there, Mo. Uh, One less than I a minute, Mo. I think there have Mo. been some terrific speeches here tonight. I think Pat's speech was the best one. Uh, it was a good campaign speech. That's why I said Pat for Congress. And Tim, you hit you hit the, the bullseye on the mark when you said when you said uh, we need love. Maybe I should make a speech on how we can get it. But the thing I wanted to say right now. Uh, someone said, Don, uh, made a good point, that Donald Trump can't be a fascist because even Mussolini knew what he was doing up to a point, uh, Hitler up to a point. Uh, okay. Trump gives the appearance of not knowing what he's doing. I'll tell you what he's doing. He's doing the same thing he did that got him into uh, millions of dollars worth of business, although he's not as rich as he claims. Um, he's doing the same thing that got him elected what he's time. doing he's is kidding. appealing to um, okay. uh, 30 percent or 40 percent, whatever it is, of okay. American people, to become something that Hitler wasn't able to achieve: unpaid brown shirts. Okay, Mo, you got to wrap it up. I'll wrap it up. All right, Brett, Mo. Uh, and the, uh, the danger is that. He wants to get impeached because that will make them so mad they'll come out in the street and they'll, oh, okay. they'll have a coup d'etat. All it. right, That's Margaret, it. you want to have a minute? What? Margaret's Margaret, behind you. I actually did not accuse Mr. Patel of being whatever it was. I said he certainly implied anti-Semitism and racism and anti women and etc cetera, etc cetera, in his remarks um, I think that um, a name for our president besides El Lider y El Cadillo etc etc is El Pussy Snatcher because that's the way he has put himself up also commander in uh, Cheetos that's the other one I like okay. and I'm sure that other people can come up with things that are even more creative than that but I think that uh, that's just I mean I you know this this kind of uh, backhanded inferences that that uh, black people are lazy and they just sit around and get uh, welfare payments or whatever it, you know this is this has got to stop. We have to look at what we have done, and we have done some very serious, very immoral, very bad things to people. Okay, thank you. All right, all right. Yeah, we're going to gavel us out, but there is one good thing about Donald Trump. At least the first ladies and the women surrounding him are looking great. Yeah. <laughs> I know, a silly point. That's a little sexist, Tim. Uh, yeah, but I'm being a little bit, I'm I'm being a little bit facetious, too. It's, it's nice to see some good-looking women next to a president. Anyway, enough said. We're going to gamble us out. Thank you, everyone, for participating tonight. I really appreciate the good speeches. We'll see you all next week. Hey. What did we learn today? We learned it's so oh so easy to dump on Trump. It's so, so easy to dump on Trump. <laughs> Turn it on, yeah. Trump. Yeah. Trump right. yeah. Thanks you can a lot. Back to back in the greatest back to back. People bash the Democrats too much. I know they let us down. They're not very good, but they're better than the alternative. We must resist the fascists.
We have okay. a couple of alternatives. One of them is if there is a special election, then we better not bash the Democrats too much because they would be our hope to get rid of Trump and Pence both without handing a president Ryan. If we do have to wait for the 2018 November election, then we definitely will have to depend on the Democrats because we're not going to do a third party and split the, uh, the, the left and left the center vote. We can't do that. That would, that would be destructive. Okay, that's all I want to say.